going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Tonight we are going to be doing some uh, curse words, blasphemy would you say. Um, we're going to be doing pocket holes. And I've got this blue doohickey made by a company called Craig. Yeah, this is going to be very interesting because um, we're going to have some fun. <laughs> Was it on Craigslist? Ooh, it's both different. <laughs> uh, so we are working on the joinery window and this is a really fun project it has six pieces with nine joints each joint being completely different uh, historically this has been done a lot of different ways with a lot of different joints um, it was common for this to be an apprentice project um, it's a great way to practice different joints but not only that you have to make sure that all of the joints are dead exact otherwise there's going to be small compounding errors that when you get to that last joint they just don't match up and so being able to do it well um, is a really solid skill. And so this is a, a fun one to, to work through. So we're going to be doing this. This one I made uh, two or three years ago when we did a live series on it. So now we're doing another one with this. And so we've done uh, so far, what is it, six? One, two, three, four, five, six, six joints so far. So we have three more to go. And tonight we are doing the pocket hole. Now, uh, the list of nine joints that I have here are ones that I find to be interesting, fun, and useful. And the pocket hole has kind of gotten a bad rap. Um, and so I really want to, to talk through that and explain why I have it on this list. Uh, but before we do that, we've got to do a few announcements of, of things coming up. Um, number one, I've got a pile over here. Um, and I'm not talking about the one in the chair over there. Oh my, I'm about to die. <laughs> what did he just call me? Uh, the really this gorgeous, is where she go. A really gorgeous woman <laughs> over yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. so isn't she pretty? Out of focus, but pretty. <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always hard to focus. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got this pile here. And uh, these are all chair parts from Matt Cremona. Uh, so I bought uh, 10 chair sets. So we're going to be doing that. Um, but yes, we are going to finish Sarah's bench. We still have to do the, the top, the dog holes, and the feet on it. So that is coming up here soon, um, eventually. Eventually. But, uh, uh, let's see, what other things do we have going on in the shop? Um, I've got a pile of projects. Luke is going to be coming tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are a patron on Patreon, Patreon or a member, uh, you'll see notifications coming out tomorrow, 8 a.m. Central Time. We'll be going live in the shop. Uh, so we'll be working on a few things. Um, so patrons and members, um, you get access to that. When, whenever Luke comes over, uh, we're doing a bunch of projects and we go live so you can actually see the behind the scenes. We're going to be working with this block of weird exotic wood. Um, yeah, mango. Mango. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, what is it? Oh, oh, MWTCA is coming up uh, in two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's uh, two weeks from this weekend? One week from this weekend, right? Mm, it's the first and it's the it yeah one week the from this weekend two weeks well it's two weeks from tomorrow two weeks from tomorrow it starts yeah okay so two weeks Mock me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's in madison wisconsin and if you don't know the mwtca is the largest tool sale uh, hand tool tool sale in the entire world it is just mind-blowing and we haven't had one in two and a half years so i'm uh, really really looking forward to this um, and if you are going to be there um, contact me. We're going to be setting up. Hey! <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> We're going to be setting up a meetup um, probably on Friday afternoon, uh, usually around five o'clock. I haven't found a good location for it yet, so we might just be meeting in the lobby of the hotel. Um, but as soon as I find that, we will uh, we'll work around it. Oh, there's places in Madison. We yeah, it's just finding a, a good. Uh, a good place with the with a Dr. Seuss coat, the more pocket. So, um, <laughs> if you have a good option for it, someplace on the the west side of Madison, um, let me know. But yeah, stay tuned for those of you who want to do the meetup. Um, even if you're not coming to the tool meet, uh, we'll be hanging out there. So, lots of fun things happening. So, pocket holes, uh, pocket holes. Uh, this is a, a this has gotten a very bad rap, as and it tends to be a very weak joint it by itself is much, much weaker than a, than a mortise and tenon. So with a mortise and tenon, you have a tenon that goes into a mortise and you have a mechanical connection there. Even if the glue breaks, there's still a mechanical connection that's holding them together. With a pocket screw, you have two pieces that butt into each other and you have one 
or two screws that go into it. And the problem with that is that all that's holding it together is, is the screw. The glue with the end grain to the surface isn't going to hold it very well. And so you're going to run into problems with how does that actually go together. It's something that can weaken up. However, it does have one huge, huge benefit is that it is a little bit loose. And that little bit loose has value anytime you're going into a cross grain situation. So we tend to think of pocket holes in terms of the Craig jig. Uh, this is something that is relatively new in comparison is to have this jig and a method to, to, to run it to, through. Um, and so the Craig jig, this is a really simple one. It has this angled slot inside and it is out of focus. Um, and what you have is a special design bit that will then slide into it and will create a shoulder and a spot for the screw to go through. I'll show you this in a moment. Um, and a lot of people have started using this for pretty much all joints. And you can see entire furniture put together with this. And that's where it gets a bad rap because that's not a great way to do it. You're not going to get incredibly strong, long-lasting furniture. Will it work? Yes. Will it be functional generally? Yes. Um, and for a lot of applications, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you're doing, you know, heirloom quality dresser drawers, this isn't what you want. The place where this does shine is cross grain situations. So if you have a stretcher, now let me grab a board here. If you have a stretcher underneath a tabletop, on the end of the table, all of the grain of the wood is coming out this way. And you have a stretcher on the end that needs to go on this way. Well, that grain is going to want to expand and contract along the length of that stretcher. Well, that stretcher won't expand and contract because wood does not expand and contract along its length. It only expands and contracts across its width. And so if you put in pocket holes going through the board up into the top, those screws can move a little bit with that expansion and contraction. You get a strong joint holding it up into place with an allowable movement. And so that is a great way to do it. And it is a very, very, very old way of doing it. Hundreds and hundreds of years old. And they used these particular things to make it. And so we'll be showing you that. So we're going to go through a couple different options on here. Now, one of the big debates when it comes to pocket holes is in what orientation do you do them? So if I have this board here and I want to take this board and run it into there, Craig Jig will tell you, put the screw through this board into this board. And that will give you the strongest hold on the head because the head is then being held, all the grain is going vertical here. So that grain um, can hold into that. If you put the screw in this way, well, the grain going this way can then split out that end. And so you get a weaker connection where the head is. However, if you put it in this way, you get a stronger connection where the threads are. And if you put it in this way, you get a weaker connection where the threads are. And so if you are going to be putting it in um, a tabletop where it's running into other grain, going this way is really, really strong. And for a lot of the Craig jig screws, um, the head ends up being very, very close to the end of the grain. And so you want to make sure that your screw is going this way when you're making a Craig jig. However, you'll see in a lot of the historical forms other than tabletops where it has to go this way because you're working in a stretcher, it's actually stronger to put the screw in this way because you're going to give the threads a stronger connection. And if you build a little bit more space for the head, then there is enough strength on there. And so you can actually get a stronger connection putting the screw through this way. And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight because we can adjust where we put the head. If you're using a Craig jig, then generally you're going to want to drill from this side into that side. Now I know that's going to start a lot of arguments because there are a lot of specificities. And if you look at the Craig jig, they're going to tell you go from that way, but that's because it's using the Craig jig. But uh, we're going to go against the grain. So let's actually look at some of this and how we can do it. We're going to use a Craig jig with a brace. Yes, you can do that. Um, and this is one of these, these fun things. Any questions while I'm setting this up? Uh, rotate this a little bit. Yeah, let's see. Alex asked, do pocket, does pocket joinery need glue? Um, well, if you're gluing in-grain boards like that, like we'll be doing tonight, glue is not going to do much of anything at all. Um, number one, you need a compression strength, so you need to clamp it together for the glue to dry. 
and you might get a little bit of holding, but in an ingrain application, most glues are not gonna do anything for you. They'll break out pretty easily. So putting the glue in there, it'll help a little bit, but it won't help worth anything in the long run. Um, so generally, no. So with this, now normally I, I was trying to find my, my vice grip, so I'm gonna have to use a squeeze clamp here, so it's not gonna be as strong, it's probably gonna wiggle around a bit, but oh well. We'll Seriously, live with what we get. Your vice, where is your vice What's that? So where is your vice grip? I don't know. So what we can do with this is it's the exact same thing. It slides yeah. in here. And yeah, it's gonna wiggle until I get it adjusted. And the great thing about a Craig jig is it's all set up on there. <laughs> I'm gonna be digging into the Craig jig a little bit because I'm wiggling. And so we can just go until that bushing touches and everything is set up the exact way it needs. It drills out a hole that almost pokes out the outside, gives you a really nice clean surface in here, and where's my Craig jig screw? Oh, it's way over here, sorry. So it's perfectly designed for the Craig jig screw so that the head just barely fits inside there. Let me zoom in on this. The head just barely fits in there. Now I know it'll go in around like that. But this gives you plenty of strength for going cross grain. You put these in on the underside of your stretcher up into your tabletop, and that is a, a great, great joint. Um, so that's why generally with a Craig jig, you want to drill across the grain where the head is going to be. That way, if anything does break out, it's going to be on the thread side because you're going into end grain here. You're gonna have a very, very weak joint on the threads. So that's why generally I like to go around the other way when I can adjust where this goes. Now, the question is, how do we do something like, how was that done historically? And historically, it was done with something like this. This is a Craig jig, basically. Except for it's not the jig, it's just the cutter and everything in it. So this can run in, it drills it out, and then it's got this conical shape head here that rather than having a flat shoulder that you would have with the Craig jig, this will give you a countersunk bit so you can put in a regular flathead screw. The other thing you'll notice is that there's a much longer distance here from the tip back to the, the shoulder in comparison particularly to the Craig jig. And that would allow you to have much greater material between the edge of your board and back here. So rather than drilling right up in here, I would actually start drilling back here to run it all the way in. So we're actually gonna do that tonight. I've got this one, which is a little bit short. It's not quite as long as that one is, but it's still a lot longer than the Craig jig. So with this, I'm gonna back it up a little bit. I'm gonna start it somewhere back here. I'm gonna start vertical until I get that tip in there. And I'm gonna slowly crank it down. I wanna get an edge started in there without it sliding out. Oh, now I'm, I'm creeping. Didn't let it go in far enough before cranking it down. There we go, now we're set in there. And I want to make sure I don't raise this handle. Here, let me turn it over this way. I wanna make sure I don't raise this handle up and down. I wanna keep this exactly in place. I'm gonna lock it into my body and I'm gonna start cranking this end. How would you sharpen something like that? Or I'll be that? showing that in a moment here, actually. I probably started this one back just a hair too far. Because that bit, yeah, I'm about a half inch away. So I should have started about a half inch closer. I was thinking more along the lines of this one. Because you can see with this one starting way back here, I've now got about an inch and a half of shoulder material for that to go through. Let me zoom in on that a little more. So I can see I've got from here all the way up to here as material for that board to go through. So if I'm going to end grain, that's actually not that weak. Whereas here, I've only got about a half inch of material here that it's going into. So how do you actually sharpen one of these? And this one actually needs to be sharpened. So I'm gonna grab a file here, and this whole surface here is perfectly flat. So I can set this on here. And this side over here, 
this side over here, as it's the one that leads around and scoops out the wood, this side is what needs to be sharp. This side does not need to be sharp. It's going to be a little bit, but this is the side you want it to be. So I'm going to be going on this until I see clean material all the way across there. And I feel I've got a nice sharp edge on that one. So let's actually give this one a try. Any questions while I set that one up? Um, not necessarily related to the project right now. Oh, what do we got then? All right, so Tommy Roberts asks, how far down is the screw for your leg vise from the top of the bench? Um, I don't remember exactly. I think I have like eight inches. You, you want the screw to be as high as you can get it because the proportion between the screw and the top of the bench and the screw and your spacer on the bottom, the greater that majority is. In other words, if the screw to the top is one third of the screw to the spacer, then you'll have three times the pressure on the screw um, because you'll have more leverage on that spacer on the bottom. Um, so you want to move it up as high as you can, but you don't want to move it up too high. And so usually the nut that it goes into has to be below the bench top. And so that really determines where it is. So usually if you have a four inch thick bench top, that nut usually has about four inches of material. So your screw is usually down about eight inches. Um, so that's where you want to go. So we just sharpened this one up. Let's give this one a try. This one's got the longer start. Haven't used this one before. So let's see what we got. And this particular bit type is called a gimlet. Is it called the Gimli for short? Oop. Nothing. Let me sharpen this a little bit more. There we go. So I'm just going until the point just sticks out the other side. The other thing you'll notice is that this is a lot wider. That's because all of the handmade screws had a very, very wide head. And so in this case, um, I've got a lot of material here, but I've got that lead screw that ran all the way through and out the other side, and it's coming out right about the middle of the board over here. So I've got a much, much stronger connection because I have a lot of more material to go through than I would with the normal one. And so that's that. The other thing you'll notice is there's always going to be this massive blowout on this side due to those scooping out. So you can just come in with this, with a knife, and clean it out a little bit. Let's go this way. And that'll give you a much cleaner joint. So now this is the common way you'd see it if the woodworker had a pocket hole bit to use. But a lot of them didn't because that was a very specialty thing to make. So I'm going to try when we actually, well, I'm not going to try, I'm going to show you when we do it on the actual joint how to do it without any of that. We are just going to hand cut this without any of the gimmicks, without the Craig jig, just the basics. Also on top of all that, we're going to be talking about how to lay it out because one of the most important things about this whole joinery project is learning how to lay this out. Because we want this board to butt into this board over here. And because I cut these all out, this board, oops, let me grab up and show you which one. This board here is the same length as every other board. I made sure when I made them, they were all exactly the same length. So I need to subtract from this the thickness of this board. Now the nice thing about this joint is I don't have to figure out where this goes. A pocket hole is a one-sided joint. With everything else here, I'm going to be cutting on both of the boards to make them go together. But with a pocket hole, all of the joinery is done on one side. So it doesn't matter lining up where it needs to go. I don't need to draw connections from that. I just need to know how much do I cut off of this board so that it will perfectly touch and butt in with it. Um, but first got to take this apart. So, what questions we got? Anything? Uh, yeah, I have one more from Sean. I think it's two. Uh, what wood did you decide to go with for the toe and knob on the transition plane project? Um, 
You'll have to wait and find out. Oh, oh, so Mostly secret. because I haven't guessed yet. I'm going to make it tomorrow, but I haven't, I haven't come into it. I'm probably going to be using um, the, uh, the mango. Um, mango wood. I've never used it before, but I'm going to be playing with it. It's got some really cool grain, and I think the oil is going to go wonderfully on that. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. I know, we're not white oak. Pull these apart. And also, before we get going into this, I need to mark these two joints so that I know they go together. This is going to be something that we always do. We always mark the joints when you're about to go together, otherwise you're going to run into issues. So this is joint number seven. It's going to be on this far side over here. So I'm actually going to... So before the, they had painter's tape or whatever tape that is you have, mm -hmm. what, would they use something specific to mark their joints? Um, it depended on if, if they haven't done the final smoothing, uh, a, a pencil or a piece of chalk would do fine. Um, but a lot of times the marking was actually done on the inside of the joint. Mm -hmm. So when they went, they went together, it would disappear. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll also see it on the inside of cabinets or the underside of tables where no one would ever look. You'll still see marks and, and notations on there. Um, so yeah, before painter's tape, there are lots of other ways of doing it. <laughs> so this board needs to go into this board and I need to take it off minus this thickness. Now, I could put this board on here and make the mark on where this shoulder is and make it match this board. But because I know I've spent the time and these two boards are exactly the same length and every board in here is exactly the same length, I'm just going to subtract this thickness. Now, what a lot of people will do is they'll measure this. Let me show you. I'm going to grab my tape measure and I'm going to drop it on the ground. That's incredibly important. You have to make sure you do that. I'm going to measure this board. And this board is two and a half inches. It's actually just a hair under two and a half inches, but pretty close to it. So I'm going to set this on here and I'd make my mark at two and a half inches or just a hair under it. But that has a little bit of variability. I'm looking for joints that are within a hundredth of an inch in accuracy. And this doesn't have hundredth of an inch increments. It doesn't even have 32nd of an inch increments, much less 64ths. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this right on top here, and I'm going to use reality. Make sure my camera is actually balanced, right? And so I can put this on here. I'm going to flush up this side with my fingers. And then once I get that exactly flush, I'm going to come in here. I'm just going to put one small nick right into my face side because the side with the marking, that's my face. Now I'm going to grab a square. I wish I could find my little square. I don't know where it went to. It was on you. I'm going to put my knife into that mark I made, slide the square up against it, clamp everything down in, light mark, heavy mark, or medium, and then a heavy mark. Roll this over, but I don't want the square to be on this side because this is my reference face. Put the square on the reference face, put the knife into the mark, slide it up against that, light, medium, hard, roll it over one more time. Because I referenced this edge earlier, we're going to do the same thing again. Put it right into that mark, slide it up against. It's starting to sound like a broken record. Then when I bring it up here, I don't want my fence on this side because this is the side of the tape. So put it on the reference side, put the knife into the mark, slide the square up against it, and you'll notice that these lines match up perfectly. Even though I haven't checked them, even though I haven't looked at them, I know they line up exactly where they need to, right there. I haven't even looked at that. Does it actually line up? Yes, look at that, it lines up. Ha! Huh. <laughs> um, that, that's one of those things that always making sure your fence, the, the fence of the square is on your reference surface and not just rolling around. Otherwise, you're going to create a spiral around the board because there are small, tiny imperfections, and those tiny imperfections add up. So now that we've gotten this, let's cut it. And we're going to do my favorite way in the vise. I know that drives a lot of hand tool woodworkers crazy, not using a bench hook, but I like it this way. Here. 
me actually set this up over on this side so you can see what advantage what like. or with the bench hook or what uh, the, the bench hook is, is a little bit faster however the putting it in the vise is much much stronger this board does not move it is locked in place i'm having it in a bench hook i'm holding it i'm clamping it into place so if my hand loosens at all the board may wobble um, and so it takes a moment longer to put in the vise and to take it out of the vise um, but i find i get a little bit more accurate putting it in here as opposed to putting it in that um, here actually i'm going to do something a little bit different here if i can get the camera over the side so i can show you a little technique if i can get the camera over here any questions on this? Nope. Yeah, I can get it from the side. Cool. So when sawing freehand, it is very important to lock the camera in place so it doesn't wiggle around. Move it off the bench so it doesn't wiggle. It's very important to get it right where you want it. And so on here, you should be able to make out the line I have right here. Mm -hmm. And so I want to put the saw on the outside of the line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pinch the board. And you probably can't see it because my hand's in the way, of course. <sighs> Best laid plans. I really wish I could have a good camera placement, but I need it to be in a place I can't You need a GoPro on your head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here, let me move this. Let me try one more thing. I need to move this cord way over here. Do you want me to hold the camera? Um. And angle it, like, at you? If you want to. Well. I think okay. I can get it within the, from this angle here. Oh. Yeah, I think I can get it from here. So on this side, yeah, I'll move my, eh, no, I still can't get it. Yeah, why don't you come on over? Let's see if we can do this. Because this is something I've been wanting to show. I talk about it quite a bit, but it is hard oh, yeah. to actually get. Ah. Get yourself? Here, why don't you step over here? So it needs to be like right about here. Like there? Yeah. So I want to actually pinch it here. So what I'm doing is I'm going to pinch the board. I'm going to let the saw slide on my thumbnail here. So my thumbnail can push it side to side to get it accurate. My saw is then pushing against my thumb. And this allows me to very accurately put it. But if my thumb is up here, it, there's a little bit of slop in here. So what I'm actually going to do is pinch the corner of the board. And when my thumb's on here, if I pinch the board a little more, it pushes my thumb over that way. And I loosen up the pinch and it brings it back this way. So I can do a very fine adjustment by pinching the corner. And I can put this on here. Just like that until I get it established. So being able to pinch the board and letting it slide on your thumbnail allows you to get a very, very accurate cut. I'm right on that line. No chisel work needed when it's all done. So that is what I'm going to show you. Thank you, babe. You make a great tripod. Thanks. <laughs> Surprised you haven't shown people your shirt yet. I don't know if anyone would get it. I don't know if anyone would understand my shirt either. Well, not in focus. Oh, no, was it not in focus this whole time? Oh, I hope not. Well, I'll have to get another time. I want to get a... It looked in focus when I was looking through it. The problem is I can't set it. the camera on the bench. Otherwise, it vibrates with the bench top. And, uh, so I need to get an articulating arm. I can put the camera out over here because I can't get the camera on top of the bench. I could shoot from above, but then you really can't see it. So let's cut this. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to cut straight down like I would with a, uh, with a bench hook. I'm going to cut at an angle from this corner back here to this it corner here. I was focusing on James's jeans. Oh man. <laughs> uh, and so what this will let me do is I can see the line on my side of the board here and I can follow that line precisely. So now I've cut at an angle from corner to corner and I can see the line on his side and I can see the line on this side. If I rotate the board 180, now I can repeat the whole process and I can see the line on every side that I cut it on. Just like that. And I'm left with a really clean cut. That's joint ready. 
right off the saw. And so now this board can go into this board, just like that, and they're pretty. Now because we're going to do this one a little bit differently, we're actually going to cut the pocket hole joint with a chisel. And I need to choose a chisel that is slightly wider than the head of the screw that I'm sticking in. In this case, I'm actually going to use a Craig hole, a, a Craig screw, because um, I wanted that flat shoulder. I'm trying to find where to put it. Oh, here. Here's the original one that I did last time. This time I used a, the last time I used a, uh, a Spax screw, one of my favorites. Oh, come on. Uh oh. My tripod squeakers. Turn, turn. There we go. That's better. And focus. So last time I used a Spax screw, and that's a little bit wider than the Craig screw. So this time it was, uh, wasn't quite a half inch. Um, this time I'm going to use a 3 8 because that's the same size as the screw. The other thing I want to do is I want to know how far to have it away from the edge. Um, yes. So this time I went through from here up into that just like I would have on a, uh, um, on a uh, tabletop. And this time we're going to turn around and go this way as it says to do with uh, Craig Jig. And where am I going here? I need to grab, sorry, switching gears. I'm going to grab a hold fast and lock this on. And that way I can work out here where you guys can see it. It's always fun working with a camera because, oh no, my bench just split. Oh, look at that. I have a lamination going right through there and the glue just gave up. Oh well, I have to build a new bench. <laughs> Steal mine. <laughs> so first thing we need to do is I'm arbitrarily figuring out how um, how much do I want on that shoulder. And so I'm going to back it up a little over a half inch. And that will give me a little over a half inch sticking out. And I need to grab a mallet. And with that in place, it really doesn't matter as long as I figure out where I want my shoulder to be. I'm going to set that there. I'm going to go tap, tap. Then I'm going to grab a longer chisel. Here, making sure I'm where I want to be. I'm going to be here. Right, let's focus on that a little better. There we go. So I'm going to grab my longer chisel. I'm going to put that on there. And I'm going to cut back on the sides. Same thing on this side over here. And with that in place, now I'm going to come in here, bevel down, and remove the waste down to that stop. I can put in my stop cut, move the waste down to it. My bench split is causing me issues. My hold fast isn't holding as well. Such is life. Back up a little farther. And I need to cut this down in as deep as my head so that when it sits in there, it goes in the way I want it to be. I'm also cutting it at an ever so slight angle rather than being perfectly vertical. That slight angle is because I don't want the screw to be in line with the board, I actually want it to be slightly at an angle that way. So I want the angle of the head to match that angle of the cut there. There we go. And so just like that, we've got a pocket hole that will fit that head all the way down in at that angle. And actually I'm going to go a little bit deeper, the head sticking out just a hair. So we're going to come in like this. I'm just going to trim out the bottom just a little bit. There we go. Now, I could just drive this into there. The problem with doing that is I'm just going to split out this wood. So I need to pre-drill this. 
So the best way to do it is to grab some calipers and measure the inside of the shaft, inside of the threads. Don't measure it back here at the back because that is thicker than the inside of the shaft. We want the hole we drill to be right about the same size as the inside of the threads, inside the, the inside of the shaft, inside the threads. And so I already measured that out and I got, uh, where is it? This one, this bit. And it was 3.30 seconds. <laughs> what questions we got? I just love the English or the non-metrics. What, the fractional measurements? Yes. 330 seconds. And yet, not even decimal fractions. And yet we know exactly what that yeah. is. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to stick with questions that oh, relate to the okay. project right this second. So okay. I like yeah. Waffles asked, why did you cut right on the line? Shouldn't kerf be accounted for, or is it so small it doesn't matter? Um, the line, when you cut with a knife, is an infinitely small line. The, the knife cut is actually the first cut of the saw. So my kerf is ever so slightly off, so that the very side of the kerf matches that line. Um, if I do it with a pencil, then you have a thickness to that pencil, that pencil lead, whether it be you know, 0.07 or whatever it is, um, it has a thickness. And so with that, you have the design of, do you put the side of the curve on one side of the lead, on the other side, or you try and split it down the middle. But with a knife, it is the accurate measurement. Um, so you put the side of that blade right on the knife. And so that's where we had it. All right, here I've got a, uh, a quarter inch hex adapter because this chuck doesn't fit those well. And I've got a couple of videos on that. And so with this, I can actually put in a, uh, a quarter inch hex bit in there, lock it down, and I'm going to fit it in the, I'm gonna move my hold fast because it's pumping in the way. Let's actually slide it out there. And then I can fit this in. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it with that one. So I need to actually extend that out because I've got this knob on here. So to do that, we have yield DeWalt extension bit. And that will allow me to have a really wobbly bit, which isn't a huge issue. Just want to make sure it is where I want it to be and not where it wants to be. So I'm drilling this right in the center of that hole or attempting to. It's not wanting to, so I gotta move it. There we go. There we go. And normally with this size bit, I would use an egg beater drill, but with it being this close, I really don't want to mess with that. And there, the hole came out right in the middle of the board. That's where we want it to be. So now, I can put on this and try and find that screw. Where'd it go? There it is. To put that screw in there, put this in here, and sit five and a half miles away. So now, we can drive this in. Wow, you're drilling into my picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like, should I put my hat, wait. Should I put my head or <laughs> There, I'll pull it back a little bit. And so now it's ready to go into the board. Eventually, that will go into there. Um, and I don't want to put it in there until it's time to actually put it together um, because I don't want to put it in and take it out and put it in and take it out. Anytime you do that, you're actually going to end up weakening the joint. The other thing we want to be very careful of is that the angle we put the screw through, I don't want this tip if this is flat, flat on the bench, I don't want this tip to ever touch the bench. In this case, we're a solid, what, 3 16 off of the bench top, which is right about where you want it to be. So there is your Craig Jig attachment. So that is pocket holes. There are a whole bunch of ways to do them, and they are a very useful historical method of, of doing woodworking. So don't poo-poo, not pocket holes, but uh, you know, don't build entire pieces of furniture out of them because 
they, they do weaken up and they do loosen up, but that's why they are valuable because there are places where you want that wiggle, you want that movement. And the nice thing about it is when you get a, uh, an actual pocket hole bit, they go in really, really fast. Um, and so you can, you, can, you can put them in very efficiently, very, very easy, um, even faster than you can with a, with a Craig jig, unless you have like that whole Craig jig setup where you just go ka-pachinka, zinka, pachinka, zinka, sound effects included. <laughs> so let's see, uh, 840, what questions we got? Okay, uh, yeah, two more to round out the project. Um, James Letner asked, could you use a gouge? Yes, yeah. Um, rather than having it square on the sides, you can do it with a gouge. Um, it'd be the exact same thing. I just find it just as easy to make it square. It doesn't make it any stronger. But if you had a gouge that perfectly matched the curvature of your head, you could make it really beautiful. Yeah. But it'd be done the exact same way. And then Brandon Chenault asks, what size chisel are you using for that? Uh, this one is the 3 8 chisel because that the head of that was almost exactly 3 8 It was just a hair under 3 8 in width, which is what you want. 3 8 Yeah, quarter, 3 8 Yep, 3 8 All right, let's see. Aaron Fenn asked, why do we never see you use your shooting board? Um, I don't always need it. Um, whenever I cut like that, I, I don't need a shooting board. This is, this is perfectly square. I mean, I can grab it on here and it is dead square and dead square. So there, there's no reason to grab the shooting board. I cut it right on the line, so no need for it. Um, I like to do things with as few steps as possible. And so if I can cut something right on the line accurately that I know is square and is a joint ready finish, um, then it's much faster to do that than to cut a little ways away from it and then bring out the shooting board and then set up the shooting board plane and then plane it back to the line, um, which I could very well do. It's just that's more steps. And so I like limiting steps. I like to make it as simple as possible. Now that means you've got to get to the point where you can cut dead on a line and dead accurate. And so that's why I like to show you know, number one, how do you actually draw that line exactly where you want it to be? Because that's most important. If you did follow it all the way around and you get that spiral pattern, well, then the shooting board will fix that. Um, but if your line is accurate and you have the technique to saw to the line, then you don't need the shooting board. So that's usually what I tell people to aim for because it's just it's simpler. Good question, though. So, I know, I've got this really fancy shooting board that I spent a lot of time on and I hardly ever use it. <laughs> What's next? Andrew Seymour asked, where's a good place to buy Holdfast? Um, if you can find a local uh, blacksmith, that is the absolute best place to buy it. Um, I have several videos on Holdfast. Um, the best ones are made by blacksmiths because you can actually get that sha the, the texturing of the shaft. Um, to have a forge bent um, rod is incredibly strong and exactly what you want. Uh, next up, I would say Gramercy, uh, which you can get from Tools for Working Wood. Um, they are, what they do is they take three quarter rod, they heat it and bend it to shape and squish the head. Um, so they are very cost effective. However, the shaft itself is very smooth. And so a lot of times you have to come at it with a file and ding it up so you can actually get some friction in the hole. Um, and so, Cost-effective wise, Gramercy is a great way for it. Um, but you'll have to do a little bit of work and make sure they actually work with your bench. But if you want to see more, I've got, I think I have three videos now on different types of holdfasts. So where did you get yours? Uh, mine are from Black Bear Forge. And if you can get them from him, he is absolutely phenomenal. He is an incredible blacksmith out on the West Coast. Um, and I love his work. My, my planing stop is from him. Um, I, quite a few of my blacksmith items are from him, um, but he isn't always in stock um, because he has a long back order. A lot of people want to buy from him, and everything he makes is hand forged by himself. So, yeah. <laughs> What's next? Um, I'm not sure I'm saying this right. Suf Sanin asked, can you make a wood plane without a plane? Yes. Um, I actually have a couple of videos doing that. Um, 
the only reason you need a plane to make a plane is to make it faster. Um, and really, a plane is just a jig that holds a chisel. And so you can make it with just that. Um, I actually have a video. I have a video of making a box with a set of chisels. Um, I have a video of going into the woods with one half inch chisel and a leather strop, and with those two items, cutting down a tree, splitting it in half, and making a bench out of it with staked stools and all using just a half inch chisel and strop. Um, so yes, you can do all of those things. Um, no, you do not need a plane to make a plane. It's just, it's, it saves a lot of time to do that, and so very rarely does anyone not have a plane because they are incredibly prevalent. <laughs> What's next? So Harold, Harold Golden asks, we don't poo-poo pocket holes, but when would you use two instead of just one? Um, really, the, the, the place where I use pocket holes is anytime there's going to be wood movement. Um, for holding a, a tabletop down to a carcass or a cabinet top down, they are phenomenal in that location, in which case then you're going to use them you know, every... 18 inches a foot, whatever, it depends on the, the size of material and what the, the weight is. Um, they are great for that. Um, I would not use them for carcass joinery because there are better options. Um, mortise and tenon is, is just, it's an incredibly strong joint. It is something that will last lifetimes. It is, it's a joint that is designed for decades, if not centuries of use. Um, the next step down from that would be a floating tenon, like a Festool or a, uh, um, you know, the Domino or uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Dowel joinery, where you actually have a tenon that just goes into both sides. So basically with dowel joinery, you create two mortises and you put a tenon in between and you glue it. That is incredibly strong. It has a mechanical joint to it. It is twice as weak as a tenon because it has two sides, so you have two tenons there. Um, but it is still stronger than a screw. Um, and so anytime you build something with just screws, it will work. It is functional. Just don't expect it to last as long because you end up with more weak points. Once a screw starts to weaken, um, it, it continues to weaken and there's an exponential weakness to it as, it, as everything loosens up. Um, and once a screw is weakened, you really just can't tighten it back down. I mean, you can a little bit, but you're just going to end up weakening it more. Um, and so it's, it's not a... Uh, it's not a structural joint where you, where movement is a concern. If I were to put mortise and tenons up into a tabletop, then I'd have a problem with that expansion and contraction. I'd be breaking things. Um, and so in that case, that's why a screw is actually stronger than a mechanical wood joint. So it's just a, a place and time for it. It's not something you, you, it's not something that's great everywhere. Now, that, that being said, if you are new to woodworking, Pocket holes are a great way to build something quickly. Um, you can build something very quickly, get it out the shop, and, and have pride in what you do. It is a, it's a great way to get started. But if you're wanting to make something that is you know, long-term, lifetime style, uh, heirloom quality furniture, yeah, pocket holes aren't, aren't the best for that. But they are a great functional joint. So use them in the right place and don't use them in other places. Just like I would never make a mortise and tenon where I'd use a dovetail. And I'd never use a dovetail where I'd need a mortise and tenon. They each have their place, they each have their use, and use the right joint and the right mechanics in the right places. So, what's next? Hang on, I just got another question. Uh, so, Swift Sanon asked, can you make a video about woodworking in a small space? I live in an apartment and less sound will also be nice. Um, all of my videos are about working in a small space. <laughs> um, you know, my, my shop right now, well, my, my shop right now is about 20 feet by about 10 feet. Um, and that, that's a lot of space. But the space I'm actually working in is six or seven feet by 10 feet. And of that, I'm really only using like eight feet by six or seven feet. Um, it's, you know, it's what I do. Um, the exact same mechanics and the exact same setup. I've got a, uh, a guy I saw in Chicago who he actually works in his closet, which is, so his shop is two foot by six foot. And he'll do everything I do here, except for 
it's in the, the shop space. So he actually stands in the doorway of his closet and his bench is in the closet and he works on it there. So it's the great thing about hand tools is you don't need space. Um, the, the space is just determined by how big of an item do you want to make. So if you want to build a dining room table, well, you have to have a space to fit the dining room table to work on it. Um, but if you're just making small things, then that's the size of the space you need. Amy, what was your original shop? 10 by 10? Um, it was about 10 by 10. However, there was um, 30 inches of lumber on one side. So effective space, it was about 7 by 10. So, yeah, if you um, go back and watch those, um, there isn't much space there at all. <laughs> what we got next? I'm caught up on... We're caught up? Questions. And I think we'll wrap it up early. <gasps> so, yeah. no. uh, next week, we are going to be doing the full half lap, um, which is a really simple joint. Uh, but the really cool thing is both sides of the joint are the exact same thing. Um, and so it gives me a chance to show a couple different methods of doing the same thing. And it's a, a great way to... This one is probably the most delicate and the one you have to spend the most time on because if it's off in any way, in any direction, then it's spreading apart your joints. And so it's the, it's the key joint in the middle that has to be dead accurate. Um, and so we've got that. We've got one more joint to match up the corners, and then we'll do a video on actually gluing it all, to, all together live. So it's going to be fun. Um, and also, a month from today, or the, the first Tuesday of July, uh, we're going to be doing a live with... Um, um, uh, okay, uh, Rob, Rob Crosman. Ooh, mind blank. <laughs> Rob, um, Co Rob Cosman. Cosman, yeah. Um, so it's going to be kind of fun to have him in the... Uh, the, the he'll be over here. <laughs> Hologram. <laughs> so um, there were two points, two questions to that last one. Bling your favorite death metal. <laughs> um, about what about sound? Um, with hand tools, the loudest thing is chisel work, pounding on a chisel. Um, and so if you do it with a softer chisel, it, it's quieter, just takes a little bit longer and a few more strokes. Um, but it, it's by far way miles quieter than any power tool. Um, and saws, it, the bigger the tooth is, the louder the saw is, but a small saw is really quiet. So, yeah, um, I, one of the reasons why I got into hand tool woodworking is I became a stay-at-home dad and I needed kids to be able to nap during the day. And so I can be down here working in the shop while they're napping. Um, except for pounding out Morris's, that, uh, that's a little louder. That just lulls them to sleep now. <laughs> they got used to it. Yeah. I mean, you really can't hear a whole lot. Just don't do it at midnight or whenever your neighbors are sleeping. Yeah. Like, I don't think it's any louder than some people's music. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very quiet way to do it. You had one more question you said? No, that was just the follow-up. Okay. Well, then well, let's wrap this up, and uh, we'll come back next week and have some more fun. So. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, looking forward to everyone who's coming to the uh, MWTCA meet. That's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully next Tuesday I will have uh, info on the meetup. So we'll be, uh, I'll be posting that in the, uh, the hive minds here soon. So stay tuned. So on that note, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.